The following Frederick W. Reynolds Lecture is a production of Continuing Education at the University of Utah. Good evening. My name is Sandy Pershing and I am the Assistant Vice President for Continuing Education here at the University of Utah and please allow me to welcome you to the 61st Reynolds Lecture. Uh, this lecture is named after the very first director of what is now continuing education and, and what at the time was an extension service uh, at the university. And this lecture is really designed to welcome the community up to campus and to let them see the exciting things that are going on in all sorts of different areas of campus. So we're really excited to have you here tonight. And we're especially excited to get to welcome our younger constituents. Continuing education uh, serves people across the lifespan and we're really excited to have lots of classes, lots of exciting things for young people to do. So tonight is one of those things. So uh, no matter your age, we hope you enjoy the evening. Um, I just want to say a few thank yous. We're very grateful for a partnership this year with the Natural History Museum of Utah. That's their new name. And to go along with their new space that I hope you're all excited about and that you're enjoying watching go up uh, in the foothills. It's gorgeous and can't wait to see it. This has been a really wonderful partnership that's allowed us to connect with many of you who may not have otherwise heard about the Reynolds Lecture. Uh, it's allowed us to, con uh, to connect with Dr. Scott Sampson and for that we're very grateful. Uh, I'd like to also say welcome to some past Reynolds lecturers, and if I could say a special thank you to Dr. Robert Helbling, who uh, was our Reynolds lecturer in 1982, and he is the person for who is responsible for uh, bringing the Reynolds lecture out of a brief hibernation that it took about seven, uh, for about seven years. Uh, so thank you, Dr. Helbling, for allowing us to all be here tonight. We wouldn't be here without you. I'm also grateful for university administrators, university faculty and staff, university and continuing education students and instructors who are here tonight, and a special thank you to Jenny Smith and Nicole Batt and many, many uh, continuing ed staff members and museum staff members who really pulled off an amazing event for us tonight. So thank you and please join me in saying thanks to all of those people. So Club U is one of the programs that we have in continuing education that lives in youth ed. Um, have any of you here in the audience been to Club U? My girls have. I know a couple of you over there have. Yeah, I see a couple of hands. Well, we hope that many of you will, um, if young ones, will find your way to Club U or, or some of you will help some of the young people in your life make their way to one of our youth, exam youth uh, education courses. Uh, Club U is a prime example of what Dr. Scott Sampson will be talking with us about tonight. He says we need more opportunities for kids to develop a love of place. And Club U is one of those opportunities, as is the museum, uh, for people to explore their natural surroundings. Uh, we, over the past 11 years in Club U, have served uh, nearly 3,400 students who have come to the university to experience classes at the medical school. Um, our, our campus, the, the campus is our classroom. They, um, they get to get their hands dirty, blow things up, take dance classes, get on the tracks, and, and really be part of the campus community, and we're really excited about that. Whether you choose to send your own kids or your grandkids to Club U, um, like I and many of, of our staff members in continuing ed have over the years. Um, we, uh, pardon me, um, we know that you can feel good in, in knowing that you're helping to connect children with their natural world and exposing them to a campus that's ripe with possibilities. Uh, this year, our continuing education staff, which is made up of over 100 people, have committed to giving a dollar or more to allow a student uh, who might not otherwise have the opportunity to come to camp to attend camp next summer. So I invite you on your way out to join us in this effort. We have a, a jar um, on the way out the door, and, and please uh, help us to bring someone to camp who might not otherwise have the chance to do that. As you leave the lecture tonight, there, there's a jar, and if you choose to make an anonymous donation, you can just put some money in the jar if you'd like to give more and, and um, receive a receipt for that. We, can, we have folks who can help you with that up front as well. 
Uh, also, we're conducting a free drawing for one week of, of Club U next summer. Um, you can fill out a form to um, enter into the drawing on your way out tonight, and we'll do the drawing about 8.30. You don't have to be present to win. We'll, we'll do the drawing, and we'll post on Facebook um, and or call you, uh, whichever you prefer. We'll do both um, to let you know if you've won that free week of camp. So if you're, um, let's see, one other thing. Um, enjoy this evening. Thanks for being here. And I'd like to t turn the time over to Sarah George, who will introduce our speaker for tonight. She's the director of the Natural History Museum of Utah. And we're so grateful to be partnering with her tonight. Thank you. Thanks, Sandy. Um, and I want you to know my son took Club U for many years, actually. Um, we were delighted when Sandy and the Division of Continuing Ed um, and invited us to be their partner in this, the 61st Annual Aunt Reynolds Lecture. Um, it's a great honor. And as I looked through the list of speakers, I want to point out two that are especially pertinent to the museum. In 1947, Dr. Walter Cottom gave a talk called Is Utah Sahara Bound? It was a brilliant piece of work. And he actually um, foretold climate change. And that was in 1947. His collections are now being used for research at the museum. And then in 1963, <clears throat> Dr. Jess Jennings, um, who was a professor of anthropology, spoke. And in 1963, Jess actually pushed the statute that enabled the museum's founding through the Utah State Legislature. So that's a very significant year. Um, so it's a real honor to be um, partnering with Continuing Ed this year on the lecture. Um, we at the museum share Continuing Ed's commitment to outreach. And as many of you know, uh, November 18th, we are opening uh, our new home for the community, the Rio Tinto Center. And I can't tell you how much I'm looking forward to uh, inviting you to come and visit, welcoming you to the museum. Um, I think we have some views of the new building here on the screen. It's got some beautiful copper cladding on the outside. Looks kind of like Utah landscape. And that's, in fact, the metaphor that we were hoping to achieve um, with its design. We will have 11 exhibit galleries that cover topics from the Great Salt Lake to gems and minerals to past worlds with dinosaurs and fossil mammals. Um, we have outdoor terraces with exhibits on Utah geology, plants, animals, a rooftop terrace where you can look at the stars because the sky in, this, in the west is so extraordinary. And even the walk from the parking lot, you'll find, is a great learning experience with a 500 million year long timeline through geology. Um, <clears throat> in the galleries, we have a lot of hands-on activities, interactive exhibit elements, and plus we have some wonderful gallery programs, things like trash can archaeology and museum theater, real dinosaur bones, um, some of which I hope you experience tonight at the tables. And um, we have the Bonneville Shoreline Trail running right alongside the building. For those of you who are trail runners, we opened the trail on Friday, and we're welcoming you back um, along the way. We've established a conservation easement west, southwest of the building that includes the entire oak grove on the site and um, it will have hiking trails that lead out into the foothills uh, behind the museum. We've worked to make this a very green building and I invite you to come and learn more about the choices that you have um, to make all of our lives more sustainable. That's part of what we are, what our goal is in the new building. So if you have questions about the new museum, we do have an information table here tonight. And you can also find a two for one admission coupon. So make sure you pick that up before you go. Mark your calendars. We're gonna have a big community evening gala the night of uh, November 17th. And our regular hours start on November 18th. So let me introduce tonight's featured speaker, Dr. Scott Sampson. Some of you may know him from the four-part Discovery Channel series called Dinosaur Planet that ran a few years ago. And many of you may recognize him as Dr. Scott the Paleontologist from the hit PBS TV show Dinosaur Train. 
Um, we at the museum know him as a great paleontologist who specializes in studying ceratopsian or the horned dinosaurs, um, as well as a passionate advocate for the importance of science learning and for connecting young people to the natural world. From his early days as a star show presenter in Vancouver, British Columbia, bet you didn't know he was an astronomer too, um, to his time here at the University of Utah as a professor and curator, he's always had this great gift of communicating difficult concepts. And with that gift, Scott was an important contributor to our early thinking of what the future Natural History Museum should be. And so what you're going to see after November 18th in fact, is a wonderful reflection of much of that thinking. So now research curator of paleontology at the Natural History Museum of Utah and adjunct professor of geology and geophysics, Scott will speak tonight on the extinction of experience, youth, nature, and sustainability in the digital age. Please join me in welcoming Scott Sampson. Thank you, Sharon. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. It is a distinct pleasure and an honor to be here this evening, and actually to see so many familiar faces in this crowd uh, from my decade or so of living here in Utah and working at the museum. And uh, I'm going to point out one particular face in particular here. Alice, will you stand up, please? This is Alice Telford, who's been a friend of the museum for many, many years. I'm, I don't know if she'll mind or not. I'm going to say, I'm going to say anyway, you're 87 years young. <laughs> and you didn't need to do this. And it's just an amazing individual. So I just wanted to point Alice out. Um, I'm going to talk to you tonight about connecting children with nature. As I understand the Reynolds lectures, the goal is to present ideas that are timely and important and also challenging. And I'm going to argue tonight that the notion of connecting children with nature is potentially one of the most, if not the most important issue of the 21st century. Now that might sound grandiose, but I hope to convince you that it's at least something that we need to be very concerned about. I'm gonna divide up this presentation into three unequally sized parts. After a brief introduction, I'm gonna talk about an idea that I've proposed recently. It will be published in the spring in an edited volume in psychology, my first paper in a psychology volume. Um, but it's the notion of the topophilia hypothesis, which I'll be talking about in a little bit. After that, I will spend some time talking about how we might connect children with nature as parents, as educators, as universities, etc. And then finally, I'm going to wrap things up by addressing technology and media. Given that we are in a digital age, how do we use that media to help us in this goal of, to connect, of connecting kids with nature? But before I do any of that, I'd like to tell you a story about moon landings and bison. This might sound a little odd. How many of you were alive and can remember where you were on July 20th, 1969, when Neil Armstrong landed on the moon? It was one of those events. We won't go around the room and share stories, if you don't mind. But it was one of those events where people can really remember where they were. I can remember exactly where I was. I was eight years old. I was in a blue camper Volkswagen van in the rain in Alberta in a park listening to the event on the radio. Obviously a major event in the history of humanity and one that changed things for a lot of people. I also remember the very next day, July 21st, 1969, because I almost died. Uh, and that may sound a little grandiose too, but it was a little closer than I would like to admit. Keep in mind, I was eight years old. I was in a place called Elk Island National Park. My parents took me, and this is in southern Alberta. My parents took me to this place, to lots of parks. We went camping all the time as a kid. And we went to this place in part because there was a herd of bison there, a very large herd, one of the largest of the time. And at the time, it, wasn't, it was an age before there were cameras everywhere. I mean, my father had one of those hassle beds you could look down into, but it wasn't that people were walking around taking pictures. But this whole group of people on July 21st, 1969, were walking up to get closer to this herd of bison, just to experience them. Unbeknownst to us, a group of about four teenagers, boys I'm assuming, went around behind the bison and scared them. 
and they stampeded at us, all of us who were standing there. Now, everyone who had a wit of sense turned around and turned around and went the opposite direction. Should I not be doing something here with my mic? Let me know if, I, if something needs to change. Oh, I know what it is. My mic is... There we go. Can I get a hand here? Just... Um, yeah, if you could just put this back in, I'd appreciate it. I'll keep talking. So, my sister, who was 12 and a half, or about 12 at the time, is very proud to this day of the fact that she was the first person to the fence running away, and she's not known as an athlete, trust me. Everybody ran away except me. I stood there and watched the bison run right at me. And it wasn't bravery, it might be stupidity, I'll grant you that. But I stood there, and fortunately my father, who died when I was a kid, but he had the sense about him that day to look back and realize that I hadn't run away. And he went back to get me, and he scooped me up like a football, and there wasn't time to run away from the bison that way, so he went laterally and literally dove behind some trees with me and I and saved my life that day. Now, the reason I tell this story, and once again, you could say it's because of lack of sanity or stupidity or silly boy, but it was an interesting thing. What I felt, I still remember the moment. It was a pivotal moment in my life. I still remember the sense of wonder that I felt watching this herd of bison run right at me. It was absolutely phenomenal. Humans are arguably the only species to experience that sense of wonder, at least to the degree that we do in, senses like, in times like that. Most animals would just run away. But we have this capacity. And I'm going to argue that it's one of the most important things that we need to nurture in kids today. So let me now continue this a little bit. Why is it that I had this sense of wonder when I was eight years old? Well, I grew up in Vancouver, British Columbia, this wonderful, beautiful city. But more important than that, I grew up two blocks from a forest, a large forest surrounding the University of British Columbia, then called the Endowment Lands, now called Pacific Spirit Regional Park. And I was allowed as a kid to go and play in this space all the time. And it informed who I was. It's part of my being, this place. Unfortunately, it's not quite what it was. Not, today, it's not quite what it was then. But uh, it was a very important part of my childhood. That degree of freedom, of playing outdoors, is almost unheard of today. Today, children spend less than a half hour a day, on average, outside playing. Indoors, they spend seven to 10 hours every day looking at screens, the average children. They did this study a few, about six, seven years ago, and the number came out at seven hours, and they said, well, it can never get higher than that. And they did it again a few years later, and it was seven to 10, and they said, how do you get so many hours in the day? Well, they're multitasking with multiple screens. So they're staying inside, and they're looking at these screens. In addition, Outdoors, the places that we walk into every day are becoming more and more homogenous. We have the same companies everywhere around the world now. And beyond that, because children are being bombarded with so much advertising, there's more than a trillion dollars a year now spent on advertising, much of that aimed at kids. The average, this, is, this statistic blows me away. I haven't followed it back to the original study, but it's reported that an average child can identify over a thousand logos, corporate logos, and less than 10 plants native to where they live. A thousand corporate logos. That is a stunning thing. So, in addition to all of that, our children are suffering in other ways, in part because they're indoors all the time. We have an obesity problem. 20% of children in this country are now regarded as obese. We have problems with attention deficit disorder, and I'm not arguing that staying inside causes attention deficit disorder, but we do know that going outside reduces it dramatically without any kind of medication. We have high levels of depression. 17% of children are on Ritalin. Childhood has been transformed. Diabetes, heart disease. This may be the first generation of children who have a life expectancy less than their parents in the modern age. 
So what can we do about this? Well, there's a book that many of you will know written by Richard Louvre called Last Child in the Woods. It was published in 2006. And Rich Louvre rang the alarm bell, sang out this clarion call saying, our children are spending too much time indoors and it's having a detrimental effect on their health. And we need to change this now. Several other books had been written on this topic, but for some reason, this one resonated with the country. It launched a movement, what's been nicknamed the No Child Left Inside movement. Over 80 organizations around the country. There's legislation that's been passed in a number of states to legislate kids getting outside in school and things like that. So it's had a dramatic effect. What Rich Louvre did not do, though, was tell us how to connect kids with nature. Surely there's more to it than just sort of kicking your kids out the front door, which of course is something that parents don't do anymore for fear of many things. But there's got to be more to it than that. So this is what I've been researching recently. I'm writing a book on this topic, and I'm going to present some ideas on how we might connect kids with nature in a meaningful way that lasts through their lifetime and informs who they are. So what might that look like? Well, before I get to that, I need to also mention that getting kids outside may be critical to the health of the places that we live, and indeed to the health of the planet, or at least the biosphere. We now are facing this global warming crisis that by the end of this century, the planet, the average planetary temperature may warm by at least three degrees, causing flooding of coastal regions and desertification inland, displacing hundreds of millions of people. In addition, the species on this planet are getting hammered by our presence as well. The rate of extinction is such that if things go as they're going, 50%, one half of all species living on Earth today may be gone by the end of this century. That's a stunning statistic. One half of all the species alive today may be gone in the lifetime of the children born today. So Albert Einstein, obviously a very bright man, was bright in many ways, and he said the significant problems we face cannot be solved at the same level of thinking we were at when we created them. When we think about the sustainability crisis, we think about it generally as a crisis of technology. Surely we can build machines that'll fix it. And many people, including myself, would argue strongly that that's not the case. That yes, we need new technologies, but they're nowhere near enough. That in fact, we have to change our way of thinking, our consciousness. And in particular, we have to think about our relationship with the non-human world. Right now, we think about nature primarily as resources rather than relatives. We think of ourselves as superior, as outside of nature, when in fact science tells us that we are fully embedded within the natural world. And I'll come back to this point. So we have to have this change in thinking if we're ever going to achieve anything that approaches sustainability. Now, a fellow named Stephen Jay Gould, an evolutionary biologist, who many of you will know the name of, said in a very uncharacteristically Gould comment, that we cannot win this battle to save species and environments without forming an emotional bond between ourselves and nature, for we will not fight to save what we do not love. In other words, why would we ever think about taking care of the places that we live in if we don't spend any time in them, if we don't care about them? So having kids form emotional bonds with the non-human world may be the essence of truly becoming sustainable. So that begs the question, how do you form emotional bonds between kids and nature? How does this happen? I don't think you're going to do it in adults. I think that rather than placing responsibility on the next generation, which I'm not arguing at all, what I'm saying is all of us, the adults in this generation, have to have the sense to say what we're doing isn't working. We need to bring up our kids differently so they see the world differently, so they can stand on our shoulders and see things that we can't even imagine see the world in ways that are beyond our experience. So, how might that happen? Well, E.O. Wilson, another biologist who many of you will know, has had an amazing career in which he's put forth some of the most important ideas in all of the biological sciences. But he coined a term a couple of decades ago called biophilia, which trans sounds a little bit like a disease, but it translates to a love of life. And E.O. Wilson argued that we have a genetic propensity to affiliate with the living world. Now, how, does, how would that work? 
He said, well, look, for 90% of human history, we've lived as hunter-gatherers. We've lived in a close connection with the human world. So perhaps we have this built-in bias to affiliate with nature. And that may be what, what, something we can tap into as we try to reconnect with nature in this century. Well, this has been a fascinating idea. Environmentalists have picked up on it to a large degree, educators to some degree, but it's been just ignored by the scientific world. Scientists really haven't given biophilia much credit. It's been criticized at a lot of levels, most particularly being that it's pretty much untestable and therefore outside the realm of science. So I would like to propose an alternative, a modification, but a radical one to biophilia, something that I call topophilia, which means a love of place. The term is not my own. It goes back to the poet W.H. Auden in uh, 1947. It was also used, popularized by a human geographer called Yi Fu Tuan in the 1970s. But what people have talked about is the fact that we tend to form bonds with the places we live. We can do that. That is something that is natural to us. What I would like to argue is there's actually a genetic predisposition in within us to, to form these bonds with our local places. Now, how might this work? Well, how, what about the other forms of human bonding? The mother-infant bond, pair bonds. Why do these bonds exist? They exist in large part to help children survive, to help our children survive. If an infant and, and, and mother are bonded, that infant has a much better chance of reaching adulthood. And if the male is helping out with the child rearing, same thing. So it doesn't mean that it's all genetic. I'm not trying to make a sociobiological argument, but it is mediated in part by our genes. There are neurochemicals that are released by our pituitary gland, in particular uh, oxytocin is one, vasopressin is another, that are released when we're forming these bonds. And they help us, these, they're these chemicals that drive us. They've been called love drugs, but they're within our bodies helping us to form these bonds that we have. Well, I'd like to propose that we may be, forming, may be able to form similar bonds with the non-human world. We may have a genetic predisposition to do so. There's been some really interesting studies that show that the same chemicals are released when we interact with our dogs and cats. So we can form these bonds with non-humans too. And maybe they're there in part because of the fact that we have an ancient history of being hunter-gatherers, humanity, hum homo sapiens, goes back to about 200,000 years ago. We've only had agriculture for 10, 12,000 years. So we've been hunter-gatherers for over 90% of the human tenure. During that time, humanity did something that few species ever have. We spread all over the globe. Among mammals, only the Norwegian rat comes close to mimicking what we do. Crows are maybe a distant third as vertebrates, but among mammals, we're very special that way. And hunter-gatherers, it's often been said, were able to spread around the world because they learned how to get beyond nature. They developed technology and culture that allowed them to exceed and get above nature and manipulate it to whatever uh, ends they wanted. And I'd like to propose that that's not the case. That in fact, if you look at hunter-gatherer cultures today, the Hadza in Tanzania, which this man is, the Aceh in Paraguay, the San people in Southern Africa, what we see is something very different. These people do not see themselves as above nature. They do not behave like they're above nature. They, in fact, embed themselves in nature. The Aceh in Paraguay hunt over 250 different species of vertebrates, of backboned animals, and they know the life histories and the natural histories of those species intimately. They know the local plants, what they can eat, what they can't eat, what's there for medicine. They have to know all of these, all of these aspects of their local natural history. So, as a, as a hunter-gatherer, every generation for tens of thousands of years has been faced with a challenge. Every generation has been born with the capacity to live anywhere on Earth, but with the necessity to adapt to living in a particular place on Earth. And how do they do that? Not by exceeding the, the nature and going above it, but by embedding ourselves within it. And I think that that, that predisposition to, to need to understand local nature may have set us up to forming emotional bonds. We have a very prolonged childhood compared to other primates. 
And a lot of our brain development occurs outside the womb. And our emotional development then is occurring within a social and an ecological milieu, like all around us, how our, as our brain's developing. And I think that we're forming, we were made to form these bonds with local places. And I, I'm going to predict that when people are able to study this, we're going to find the same chemicals released, oxytocin, etc., when people are bonding to local place. And I won't go through them, but there's a whole set of predictions for this hypothesis as well. And if it's true, if it turns out to be correct, it has major implications, one of which is, if we're going to connect children with nature, taking them to the zoo probably isn't going to cut it. We need to connect them to the places they live, the local plants and animals, how those places work, because that's what hunter-gatherers have done for a very long time. So here's just a map showing how humanity spread from Africa. Sometime, it's, we're not really sure, between 175,000 years ago, humanity left Africa, went to the Near East, over into Australia, up into Europe and Northern Asia, across into the New World, and in a very short time spread around the planet. And I think that topophilia may be an evolutionary adaptation that was one of the key factors allowing us to spread around the globe. That's the premise I'll throw out. However, even if I'm absolutely incorrect, even if there is no genetic basis at all for forming bonds with nature, we know that people can do it. Most of the people who are environmentalists today can cite experiences like I had when I was a kid where they spent an abundant amount of time in one local place in nature. So I think this will turn out to be correct, but whether it is or not, we still have the challenge of following through. Just because mother-infant bonds develop doesn't mean it will develop in the absence of a mother, for example, in the infant. Therefore, our children may be growing up unhealthy in part because we're separating them from something that they need. They desperately need to have a healthy childhood and therefore to become healthy adults. So let me talk now about some of the things that we can do to help connect kids with nature, sort of part two of my presentation. And I'm going to suggest then that we really need to focus on what's been called place-based learning. We need to get kids outside in the places that they live. And this makes kind of intuitive sense how can you have experiences, hands-on experiences, in some place across the planet? We can do that by going outside in the places that we live. And place-based learning is a way of teaching, and a, a mode of education that is just starting to catch on and really gain steam. And it's a very different, in some ways it's a heretical approach, and yet it has a long history. John Dewey, philosopher and educational theorist, proposed the same idea back in the early 20th century. It's just only now that it's catching on. And educators who teach in this way, in place-based learning, do things differently. They base the whole curriculum around the place that the school is. They tend to help focus the education on project-based things, experiential kinds of education, something that's hands-on the kids can go out and do. And this isn't um, an advocation for, for a parochial sort of local-based education only. The argument is have kids learn first about their local oak forest or fir forest before we teach them about the Amazon rainforest. It kind of makes sense. As it was um, Robert Michael Pyle who coined the term the extinction of experience because he said kids just aren't outside experiencing the natural world anymore so we're having the extinction of experience and as he said What's the extinction of a condor to a child who's never seen a wren? We have to get kids connected. And I think place-based learning will be the key to do that. So let's take this to the first step. I'm going to break education up or childhood up into three steps. And in stage one, it's the ages of three to six. And I'm going to argue that the focal point of, of this stage should be beauty. And the premise here is that we get away from focusing, our, focusing learning on theory and minutia, facts, and instead we focus on values. And I'm going to promote the oldest values in the book, beauty, truth, and goodness. I'm going to put these forward as key values for how we bring up children. So in ages three to six, kids of this age don't have the conceptual ability to understand a lot of difficult scientific concepts, but they can sure understand the notion of beauty. They can understand the notion of empathy. And the goal here, getting kids outside, is to promote compassion. 
getting kids to be empathetic to the natural world, to see the natural world not as objects, but as subjects. As I said, not as resources, but as relatives, as things that we can have, that we need to depend on, that we can come to understand and to love. We can get kids out forming these bonds with the places that they live. A tree can become a meaningful thing for a child in a way that would, would seem alien to most of us. So beauty, it's often said that, we all know that beauty is in the eye of the beholder. What's not said very often is that the beholder's eye, the sense of beauty, depends on the experience that they have during their lifetime. And if you have an ex impoverished experience, you are going to have an impoverished sense of beauty. So if we're going to bring up our kids to understand what is truly beautiful, we need to have them exposed to the natural world so they could have abundant experience there. Let me see. Oh, let me see. So I'm going to go back to Rachel Carson, who arguably started the environmental movement. And she said, if facts are the seeds that later produce knowledge and wisdom, then the emotions and the impressions of the senses are the fertile soil in which the seeds must grow. So before we start sticking all this information into the heads of our children, and by the way, I don't necessarily approve of pushing you know, all of the grade one curriculum back into kindergarten. We're just jamming all this information into our children. Rather than doing that, let's build up the, ch the child's sense of beauty, of, of compassion, of forming these bonds with the non-human world, of building a sense of wonder, of awe, and of mystery, which kids feel naturally, but what happens is we beat it out of them. So by the time they're in later elementary schools, not high school, they've lost it almost completely because it's not part of our education. It's been said that if you wanted to design a space that was, that was ideal for teaching kids about almost anything that you could do, you'd have a tough time doing worse than a classroom. That really, classrooms are not the ideal learning environment. And let's face facts. If you're five, six, seven, eight years old, which of these two places would you rather be learning? Being outside isn't just about playing. It's how we learn. There's all this evidence now from neuroscience that tells us that we don't learn nearly as well when we're sitting down as we do when we're up and moving that we're built to learn on the move. And if kids are outside, you can build curriculum so that they can actually learn outside. Doesn't mean that classrooms are bad, just that we should augment them with natural learning spaces. But the trend is the reverse. We're cutting out recess. We're cutting out physical activity and expecting kids to digest more information, even though we know that that activity is critical to their cognitive processes, to their ability to think. So the next element here is play. Play-based education, in addition to place-based education, is critical as well. There's a whole set of curricula now that have been set up to show that if we let kids play, they can learn through that play. And in fact, they will learn and incorporate what you want them to much easier if they're outside experiencing the natural world and having fun doing it. So it's not just a matter of translating information from the teacher to the student's mind. Rather, they need to experience it through these places. And they can, whatever topic. It's not just science, English, social studies, history, you name it, could be, could be taught in these outdoor places. In addition, we need to have kids experience the animal world firsthand and up close so that they can understand, they can form these bonds with the non-human world. And that's, this doesn't happen much either. By the time most kids are five or six, they go, ooh, at the notion of holding a bug. A four-year-old doesn't feel that way. A four-year-old's going, wow, this is amazing. And the parents are going, ooh, look at the bug. We beat it out of them. But the, if we encourage it, we'd have very different children later on in life. Now, as Rachel Carson, was very fond of pointing out there's another key element in all of this, and that's where all of you come in, at least all of you who are adults. We need adult mentors. We need to have older folks who are willing to take a child by the hand and guide them into the natural world. And it doesn't mean you need to be an expert on all the local plants and animals and rocks and stars. You don't need to be. You can go explore it with them, but we need to take them out, especially these days, because the days of, as I said, picking the kid outside and saying, come back in when it gets dark, they're pretty much gone. 
For all the wrong reasons, I should point out, your chances, the chances of your child being kidnapped are no greater now than they were in 1960 or 1970, but we hear a lot about it on the media, and we've got this fear built up, so parents aren't willing to do it. So parents need to get outside with those kids. Educators need to get outside with those kids as well. So that's stage one, ages three to six, where I've argued that beauty should be the key value. At ages seven to 10, the brain is matured enough that kids are able to incorporate many more concepts. Here I'm arguing too that we need to have experiential education, but here the experience can be radically different. You can have guided experiences where the knowledge plays a part. It isn't just, it isn't purely emotional. And the educational goal I'm suggesting should be insight. So how might that work? Most of you, if I ask you what this is, you're going to, of course, say it's a sun, sunset or sunrise. Tough to tell. And then if I say, no, it's not, you're going to say, yeah, 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 I know. It's not really rising or setting. It's just the earth turning. But the reality is you're all flat earthers. Every one of you, you're all flat earthers. Every one of you thinks of this place right now as being flat. You think of that as up. When you see the sun set, you have this bodily experience of the sun setting, even though you know intellectually that's not what's happening. In your heart, that's what happens. But the interesting thing is you can experience what it's like to live on the side of a sphere that's hurling around the sun at 67,000 miles an hour. You can have an experience of that. How? This is what I suggest you do. Go to a place like this where you get a broad horizon, you can actually watch the sunset. It's best to have a planet like Venus or maybe the moon in the sky as well. Sit down, make yourself comfortable. As the sun starts to set, think about the fact that you are sitting on the side of a sphere that is turning in space. Think about the fact that there's a set of planets out there in our solar system all rotating on the same plane. And as that sun goes down, if you're lucky, you will have your first true experience as an earthling. And you will actually get a sense of vertigo and go and re hold, sit down because you'll go, wow, that is amazing. To think about the fact that I, it's not that the sun's setting, it's that the earth is eclipsing the sun as it goes down. And if you really want to make the experience great, take a kid with you because the kid will get it faster than you. So if we, this is the kind of directed experience that a, a three or four or five year old couldn't get, but a nine or 10 year old can get if you prime them and give them the knowledge and actually go and have the experience. And if you do that, you will forever look at it a little bit differently. So environmental education these days is focused all about all on ecology. And I think this is great. It's a wonderful focus. It's based on connections, things like food webs here, where you have the solar energy feeding the plants, which in turn feed herbivores, which in turn feed carnivores. Everything dies and gets decomposed by decomposing organisms. All well and good, and there's a, it's been called eco-literacy, that we need to promote literacy of ecology, and I think this makes sense. We, rather than teaching the minutia, the facts, that the flower has pistil and stamen and petals, we need to understand these bigger pictures and that everything is connected. As John Muir once said, if you tug on any one thing, you'll find it hitched to everything else. I think this is a critical concept. And as I said, eco-literacy is one of the primary, the primary focus now of environmental education. But I'm going to argue that it's insufficient, that we need something else that's absolutely critical and is currently missing. And that element is story. Thomas Berry, a very wise man who died just a couple of years ago, said it is all a question of story. We're in trouble just now because we do not have a good story. We are in between stories. The old story, the account of how we fit into it, is no longer effective, yet we have not learned the new story. And Thomas Berry suggested that the new story should be the story that science tells us, the story that's only come together in the past couple of decades that tells the history of the universe from the Big Bang to the present day. And that is your story. And it's pretty much absent right now from education. So let's see, what does this look like? Well, we all know that the universe started 13.7 billion years ago, that stars came, stars and galaxies came first, planets came much later, and that, in fact, you needed stars to create the heavy elements inside them, which are the building blocks of planets. And then those planets created the building blocks 
of life. And then life, single-celled life, created the building blocks of more complex life. And that ultimately led to animals coming out of the ocean onto land, leading all the way through mammals to us. This is a profound story, and it's more than just a series of connections. Evolution isn't just Darwin, natural selection, and a parade of species through time. Evolution is this. It's the story of everything of universe, of geology, of anthropology, and it's all unified in a single story. And it's this creative unfolding. This isn't a dead universe. It's a creative emergent place, and we're part of this story. We just don't think about it. Every one of you has this story embedded inside you. You too have these heavy atoms that were created by the stars. You have the molecules that were created on Earth. You have single-celled organisms in you and this long history of species that led up to us. There's about 100 trillion cells in your body. 10 trillion of those cells are human cells. That means that 9 trillion of those cells are microbial cells. You are more microbe than human. Now, after you get over the urge to want to run out and go have a shower, <laughs> you can start to absorb this idea that you're fully embedded in everything around you. Every human cell in your body is an amalgamation of microbial cells that got together way back when. But in addition, you have all these other cells. And they're proving to be critical. They control parts of our metabolism. They may relate to our moods. There was an article in the New York Times a few weeks ago that suggested that our relationship with, between our human genetics and the genetics of these microbial cells may be driving cancer. And it may be part of the key to, under, to solving cancer. So we are fully embedded in the natural world. That's what science tells us. We just don't think about it that way. And this story deserves to be out there. Now, am I saying that this should be the cosmology of everybody on the planet? No. But the neat thing about this story is it's the basis, it's the scientific basis of an infinite number of cosmologies with and without God or gods. There is no dichotomy between evolution on the one hand and God on the other. There are plenty of people that fit on the spectrum in the middle, and that's where we need to shoot. And am I saying that people should give up religion? No, not at all. I am not telling anybody what to believe. What I am saying is we need to teach the scientific story of everything in science class. That's what I'm arguing, and right now it just doesn't happen much. So put together, put those two elements together, the ecology and the evolution, or as I like to say, the eco-literacy and the evo-literacy. If you put those together, what you end up with is what I refer to as nature literacy. And we should be teaching our kids the ability, if literacy is the ability to read, the nature literacy is the ability to read nature, in particular local nature. Whereas ecology gives us this single snapshot in time of the present day, the evolutionary story anchors us in deep time and actually allows us to look into the future. The sense of meaning that we have has very little to do with how the world works today and everything to do with where we think we came from and where we think we're going. This story is not finished. The decisions that you make tomorrow influence the future of that story. And we need to get kids understanding that their lives have meaning for this as well. And of course, the best place to tell that is not necessarily in this environment, but in this one. If you can get kids outside, you can tell parts of the story outdoors. Every single element in the universe story, stars, earth, plants, microbes, animals, everything exists everywhere. So you can tell the story of the universe through any place. This is what native peoples have done as long as they've been native peoples. They've told their cosmologies through the places that they live. What I'm suggesting is that we do the same thing, but we inform it with the cosmology or the science that's come together in, through every area of science over the past few decades. All right, moving to the third and final stage now with kids who are 11 to 14 years old. This is an age where kids are starting to come out. Their, their hormones are now raging. They're, they're very interested in socializing. And so what can we do to help cement this notion of a connection with the non-human world? I think the value here is goodness, and the educational goal that we should be aiming at is service. 
We need to get kids thinking about the communities they live in, how they can serve those communities. So they're not just focused on how their hair looks and what brand of sneakers the guy next to them has, but they're actually thinking beyond that and caring about the place that they live. And maybe they're reclaiming a stream. Maybe they're growing a garden. Maybe they're starting a recycling program. Whatever that is, they're engaging in community because they care about it, because those roots were put way down deep when, way, when they were three to six years old and they spent time outside. That's why they care. Gandhi said, the best way to find yourself is to lose yourself in service of others. And I think that this is something that's currently missing largely from education. Now, once again, not always, and there's plenty of schools that do it, but as a whole, our education right now is more focused on the learn to earn model, the upward mobility model, right? Not about helping others. And what I'm suggesting is we can shift that around. We can anchor kids in the places that they live so they grow up to become an engaged citizenry, which is exactly what we need if we're going to pull out anything approaching sustainability. So let me wrap up then by talking a little bit about technology. In case anybody thinks I'm a Luddite and doesn't believe in technology and we should throw away all the screens and go back to being hunter-gatherers, I'm not arguing that at all, I promise. In fact, I'm well aware that kids and technology are now fully interwoven, that we now are raising a generation of, as they're called, digital natives. So how do we take this technology and help us and use it to help us achieve this goal of connecting with the non-human world. There's lots of ways. Digital storage devices that are now in cell phones, there's amazing applications. You can download an application that you, so you can point the, your phone at the stars and identify the constellations the star is looking at. Even down below the horizon, it'll tell you the constellations down there. There's another application you can have for identifying plants where you can take a picture of a leaf, upload it, and it will tell you what, plant, what kind of plant you're looking at. The same kind of thing with recording the song of a bird and identifying the bird. So here's a way to apply technology to help us connect with the local natural history that surrounds us. And I think we can, there's a lot of that can be done. My personal feeling is at that first stage that I mentioned, the beauty stage of, of kids three to six, we should pretty much avoid most of technology. That's my bias. It's not needed. We don't need to teach kids about computers at that age. It's been shown that it takes all of about a day to teach, teach a kid how to use a computer at the age of eight or nine or whatever that is. OK, social media. Social media is everywhere. Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, you name it. Social media can help us in this too. Because once again, especially once you get these kids and they're, they're teenagers, they want to interact. So how can we get that interaction to go beyond sort of inane type, types of things. And I think that there's lots of ways. Some of you may have heard of eBird, which is a program out of Cornell University, where you can go out in your backyard, identify a bird, I look at see what it's doing, how many of them there are, whatever kind of information you want to record. You can upload that information onto eBird, and that data is used by scientists to conduct research on, for example, when birds migratory birds arrive and leave. Um, it's been used to track global warming, et cetera. So this is called citizen science, and it's a powerful but nascent movement that's still growing. Five-year-olds can be scientists, at least of a sort. You don't need a PhD to be a scientist. And we can get kids out there collecting data and doing this kind of stuff. There's censuses that are done of all the plants and animals in an area, for example. Kids can help out with a lot of this. So here's a way right off the bat to, to get kids going. My dream, I'll tell you my dream. My dream is that we get children and educators and parents learning about all the native plants and animals where they live. They upload all that information to an open source, free access website. And that means any educator around the country can access this information and use it to inform their curriculum. So we get all of this place-based stuff happening all over the country. And if we do that, a lot of it will be because of social media. Then there's this mass media element, which I've been playing in recently. About three years ago, I got a phone call from the Jim Henson Company. And they said, would you like to be involved in this kids show about dinosaurs? And I said, 
really, well, what's it called? And they said, dinosaur train. And I went, dinosaur train, that's a disaster. You can't call it dinosaur train. And they said, well, why not? And I said, well, think about it. Paleontologists like me spend a bunch of our time trying to convince adults and kids that humans and dinosaurs didn't live at the same time. What are you doing sticking them on trains? And the woman said, no, 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 it's okay. There's no humans on the trains, it's just dinosaurs. And I said, wow, that's, that's brilliant, you know, that's amazing. <laughs> and sure enough, it's like chocolate and peanut butter. You put these two things together and kids just eat it up, you know? And this show now has taken off. It's now fully into its, its second season. It's been out for a couple of years. And it's one of the top rated kids shows on television. 15 million households a month see Dinosaur Train. So it's hard to get that kind of penetration, that kind of access through almost any other activity that I could care to do. And so, of course, some of you are thinking, going, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, he's a hypocrite now because he's telling us to turn off the TV and go outside, and yet he's creating this thing that's addicting kids to TV. <laughs> and you're right. So I negotiated with PBS and the Henson Company. I said, okay, the only way I'll do this is if you'll let me say something and do all these things to, to get, try and get kids outside. So we negotiated and my wife, Tony, actually came up with the line that I use at the very, the tagline of every single episode of Dinosaur Train. I say, remember, get outside, get into nature and make your own discoveries. Now, I had no idea when this started if saying this on a TV show would actually make a kid go and turn off the TV and go outside. But I'm happy to report that I've heard now from hundreds probably of parents and kids that tell me that because of this show, they're now outside. Tommy's outside the backyard digging for dinosaur bones in the backyard, and, <laughs> and Mary's out there identifying birds in the trees and, and all this kind of stuff. So they're really doing this now. So this has inspired me to think, well, maybe we can do more of this. And I'm talking to PBS right now about creating another show for six to 10 year olds that's focused on getting them out into nature. So we'll see if that happens. But I think mass media has an important role to play in this only because we need to make this shift quickly. We have about a generation to turn things around if we're even going to be, make ourselves sustainable. So I think mass media will be important because of its ability to reach so many people so fast. And one of the great things about Dinosaur Train is that it allows me to point out the fact that dinosaurs aren't extinct and they're not crocodiles. In fact, this is a dinosaur. I asked this, I was just in Cleveland on the weekend and talking to like 1,400 kids, which is an amazing thing to even think about. But I asked them, so is this a dinosaur? And almost invariably they go, no, and there's a few that go, yes. But in fact, birds are the direct descendants of small feathered dinosaurs and they truly are backyard dinosaurs. So that means, this is an amazing thing, a couple of big implications, one of which is if you want to study dinosaurs, you don't have to go and spend 10 years at university and get a PhD and travel to some far off land and hang out with people you may not like and eat the same food every day and bugs and stuff and spend your time doing hard labor. All you need to do to discover dinosaurs is open the door and step outside. And you can be there doing it. And we can encourage kids to be out there looking at dinosaurs in their own backyard. And the great thing is these birds are then a way to anchor us into this deep time story that's led up to the present day. So it's a wonderful opportunity to do that. Finally, with regard to technology, I want to mention a movement which is also nascent but growing very rapidly, which you may or may not know about. It's called biomimicry. And basically the premise is that nature has been solving technological problems for, at least on Earth, for 3.8 billion years. And if we tap into that, we can find solution to, solutions to almost every problem that we encounter. And I've just put a few examples up here. This burr at the top left, there was a guy in Europe wandering around out hunting ducks of all things, and he was getting these burrs all over him and his dog, and he thought, that's pretty amazing. How do they stick like that? And you can pull it off and it sticks, it's beautiful. And as a result of this, he invented Velcro, which of course has been a big thing. In Zimbabwe, they have these large termite mounds and biologists looking at these termite mounds have been able to figure out that somehow these termites are able to maintain constant temperature and humidity despite radical differences in um, climate over the course of, or weather over the course of the year. And as a result now there are buildings including large buildings in Harare, Zimbabwe which are modeled on this same premise 
to cool them and keep them at a constant humidity. Kingfishers have been used. The beak of a kingfisher was used to model the nose of bullet trains in Japan, greatly increasing their efficiency, speed, and fuel efficiency as a result of just looking at a kingfisher's beak. Humpback whales have these amazing front limbs with these knobs or bumps on them on the, on the edges. And these have been used, they've been added onto um, turbines, wind turbines, to increase the efficiency of the wind turbines. Nobody knew if it would work. They just said, well, it has to work for the humpback whale. Let's put, try this out and stick it in a wind tunnel and see what happens. There are thousands of examples now of learning from nature, tapping into the genius of nature. And the most fundamentally um, radical thing about this movement is that it shifts your perspective on the natural world. If you really get into it, all of a sudden, nature is not just resources, something to steal from. Nature becomes your mentor. And you can learn from nature. And it turns around your attitude towards it. So I think biomimicry is a powerful tool to help get kids engaged in understanding nature in a very different way. All right, so let me wrap up. First thing, we got to get kids outside. That we may have this genetic propensity to affiliate with local nature and form these bonds, but whether we do or not, our future as a species may depend on it. At least you can say that we're heading towards major crisis that's going to happen and either we do something to uh, ameliorate it or nature's going to do the changing for us. I think that's pretty clear. The science is almost irrefutable. And even if there's a chance that all the science is wrong and we're not heading towards any major disaster, which to me is almost uh, you know, a zero case scenario, wouldn't you still want to do these things in case? I mean, there's really no reason not to move forward. They're good for us anyway. So getting these kids outside, get, getting, getting learning based around values instead of theory, beauty, truth and goodness. And our sense of goodness is a synthetic sense that's based on what we think of as true and beautiful. And if you don't have a strong sense of what's beautiful and true, then your sense of goodness is going to be warped as well. So it's very important that we do this. As parents, as grandparents, as aunts and uncles, we can start by just getting kids outside. If you don't feel comfortable kicking them out into the neighborhood, take them out yourself. Have them spend lots of time there. Unstructured playtime. All of our kids spend their time. Every moment of their day is structured. Let them just play. The wonderful thing about nature is that it's full of loose parts, as one person said. Thousands of loose parts for kids to be creative with, as opposed to most internet games or being inside or on a traditional playground. So do that. As educators, we can think about place-based education. If you're an educator or you know educators, introduce them to the concept. See if it resonates with them. If so, try and have them learn about that. As university educators, we can think about teaching our teachers differently so that they gather a sense of what it is to do place-based education, to develop curricula with your students based on projects that you and they help to pick out. Yes, it's more difficult, it's more challenging in some ways. It breaks the silos of the ologies, um, the different disciplines, but the kids are more engaged and therefore they learn more. And the, the data is coming in that kids who learn with a place-based curriculum are not only more engaged in the places that they live, they do better across the board academically. Their performance improves across the board with place-based education. And the data has been lacking on that until recently, but it's now starting to come in and it's powerful. So we have good academic reasons to adopt this as well. We can also, as citizens, think about conserving and restoring green spaces. Because often, obviously, in inner cities, there isn't as much green space. Now, having said that, I think a backyard or an empty lot can serve to help connect kids to nature if we use them the right way. A ditch can do that. But if we can restore these green spaces, that could be critical as well. And so we need to be petitioning for those things. So it's really a societal change from the top down to reinvent what it is to be a child, to reinvent childhood. And one of the most important things is just let them get dirty. Let them get outside and just make a mess of stuff. We tend to be phobic now about 
dirt and germs and everything. We're meant to play outdoors. That's who we are. That's our heritage. And I think it's important. You're not going to form those emotional bonds if your kid is walking along the trail every time you're in a national park. I, got it. I get it. You can't just go wandering off the trails all the time. But there's places where that can happen and really needs to happen. So let the kids have this unstructured time where they can just get busy and make a mess of things. I also need to mention the new um, Natural History Museum of Utah, and I still struggle getting the new name right. But this place, Utah and the Wasatch Front, is about to have its most powerful tool ever to connect kids with nature. In this institution, you'll have scientists who know about local natural history. You'll have educators who are experts in teaching kids about the local natural history and training teachers about the local natural history. Now, education is a pretty intransigent system in our society. It's entrenched, it's difficult to change, but one of the ways to change it is from the outside in, by creating programs and examples that influence the schools from the outside, giving teachers um, curricula that they don't need to work at. They could just go and insert into the classroom, and this Natural History Museum can do that. And Sarah talked earlier about the vision that we've had for this museum now going for well back over 10 years. And, and I think the most powerful metaphor that came out of all the thinking around this was that the building itself, although it will be absolutely gorgeous, trust me, the building itself is not the be all and end all. The museums are reinventing themselves too. And rather than being destinations, this museum will be a trailhead. And I think that's a much stronger metaphor that this museum is where you start to go be before you begin your exploration of Utah. And whether you're going to the Wasatch Front or the Great Basin, or you're going to Southern Red Rock Country, any of these places, going to the museum will help you understand that place in a much deeper sense and therefore allow you to communicate this to your kids as well so that they can have a deeper, richer experience when they're exploring Utah. So I'm very excited about uh, the opening of this new museum and it, it will be a tremendous asset to the people of Utah. Finally, I need to just bring things round back to my own life. I've moved around quite a deal as an adult and that's one of the things that makes it difficult to embed yourself in place. But because of that experience I had in that forest growing up, I'm still able to find that I can dig in roots wherever I live. And I, I'm actually fortunate enough to live here now. Um, it's the coast of California, just north of San Francisco. And it's a wonderful place with redwood forests and this gorgeous beach country and things like that. Um, but more important than any of that is that now that I can, I'm still working on this myself and trying to become more place-based myself and understand my own local natural history better. I'm still climbing the curve, but there's an important reason for it. This is my daughter. This is Jade, and this is a couple of years ago. Jade is now uh, just turned nine years old, but this world is going to be Jade's world. It's going to be your world, right? And we as adults owe responsibility. We have a debt. To, we need to make sure that this world is left so that the kids, when Jade grows up, she has something to enjoy too. So we have a responsibility to future generations to take this generation and help them embed themselves in the natural world. And I have to say, I've, uh, I've decided I'm, gonna, I'm devoting most of my life to this problem right now and, and solutions, and a lot of it has to do with Jade. I just keep thinking about the fact that you know, a world with half the species gone is not a world that I want to leave for her. And so we need to do everything we can to help correct this problem, which is at least as important as all these other major problems that we're trying to solve right now. So I'm going to end it right there. Thank you all very, very much. I appreciate your listening. I'd like to say thank you to Dr. Scott Sampson on behalf of all of us here tonight. This is just a token of our appreciation. Oh, thank you very thank much. Thank you very much for the inspiring words. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. Thank you so much. Would you be willing to take a couple of questions? Yeah. Uh, Dr. Scott Sampson is willing to take some questions from anyone in the audience. We'll take a few, and then we'll invite you to join us for some dessert.
Now, the, the funny thing is about giving a talk like this is I pretty much covered every topic on the planet, so it's open season. So this is a friendly crowd. Let's keep it nice and friendly. Yes? Have you thought of expanding this with PBS to do a series for adults and particularly teachers? Yes, we've talked about doing that. Uh, so the question is, have we thought about expanding this to do something for adults and teachers? So the vision that I'm trying to push right now, and I'm sort of getting, I'm getting some traction on, but I'm going to need to go and find the money to make it happen, is to create a show that's aimed mostly at kids, but provides activities for kids and parents and educators to do. That becomes the centerpiece of a national campaign to get kids connected to nature. It's tied in with their internet site, but I'd also love to form a consortium of natural history institutions, including the Natural History Museum of Utah, that can provide local content. And there'll be a national nature club if all this happens. So all of this would be aimed at kids and at adults. And we need something on a grand scale like this if we're going to be successful. So you're exactly right. Thank you. Yes, sir. To be, uh, to be mailed out to those of us who came. Could I provide you with an outline to be mailed out? An outline of, of my lecture. I can, do, I can do better than that. Assuming that you have the internet access. Um, and if not, I'm sure the seven-year-old in your neighborhood will be able to help you out. <laughs> the, the talk, is, I understand, is going to be put up online, the entire thing. So it'll be available for anybody who wants to see it. Through, on the continuing education website. Yes. Other questions? Oh, come on, I covered everything. There's got to be questions. Yes. You mentioned it briefly. I was wondering if you could just say a few more um, ideas about other subjects besides science. Obviously, our nature is very science. <laughs> So if you could just say a few more things about English, um, social studies, those other subjects you mentioned about being outside and learning those things. Right. So I think that place can serve as the core for, un for totally understanding English. Kids are inspired more when they're walking and moving outside. Um, there have been a, some studies now with keep teaching kids English that it's more productive and they come up, they can be more creative. Once again, you've got all these loose pieces around you to be creative with. The thing about the outdoors is that it's multi-sensory, that we are, we are depriving our senses right now, that we, we aren't even awakened to the sounds and the smells and the tastes and all these things that we hear in our, in our environments. And so getting kids out and awakening those senses makes them much better communicators, whether or not they're commuting, communicating, whether they're writing poetry or essays or writing about history or social studies. And, and this place-based education movement is not just about science and nature. It's about history and social studies and um, everything that's community-based as well. Where does your community come from? How did it get here? Who are the indigenous peoples that lived here before us? Who were the first pioneers that were here? Now this is a place where the story is, is probably was well known as almost anywhere in the country, but it isn't known very well in most places. And so I think that you can take virtually any aspect of academics and do, do it very well and maybe even better outside. So Cara, thank you very much. Yes, sir. Best damn lecture I've ever heard. Oh, that's nice. Listen to that. Thank you. Yes. Any other questions? We're going to wrap it up. Anybody want to be the last question? Anyone else? Yes. Um, do you know of any research? Uh, about the bonds that adults form with place because it's fine to get kids out there and they have a lot of neuroplasticity and whatnot and it's really easy for that to happen but what about the adults who kind of have missed the boat already yeah it's a great question so what about the adults and i think that if for example you grew up in an urban environment and spent all your time indoors and you never have any time out in nature basically you need the equivalent of an intervention 
to start forming bonds with the non-human world. You don't have those emotional ties that, that, you, that were formed when you were a kid. Um, so is it impossible? No. I think it's definitely possible, but I also think it's like learning a couple of different languages as an adult. And that's challenging too. And the reality is most adults aren't going to do this. So the reason that I'm focusing on kids is that I think we have the potential is there in kids to go further than we can go. Having said that, I think all adults need to take steps in the right direction. And it's pretty straightforward and fun and easy thing to do and healthy just to get outside get into nature and make your own discoveries, but get outside and <laughs> explore with your kids and start reawaken that within you. I mean, it's amazing if you talk to adults who go on these courses where they spend a weekend or a week outdoors, they go, wow, I haven't done this since I was a kid. This is amazing. This is phenomenal. Now, this is once again a state that's non-typical because many people come to Utah because they love the outdoors and they experience it more than in other states. But having said that, there's still lots of nature deficit disorder, as Richard Louv called it, going on in the state of Utah as well. All right, once again, thank you all very much. It's been a pleasure. And if anybody else has further questions for me, I think I'm going to be at a table over there signing copies of a book about dinosaurs, which is the thing I'm doing when I'm not doing this. And if anyone has any other questions they want to throw at me, please feel free to come by. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. And please stay, enjoy some dessert, enjoy some time uh, talking with one another about the amazing words we heard tonight. And thank you again so much, Scott Sampson. Thank you. You were amazing. Thank you so much.